Hi, I'm Amina Harris. I'm the director of the Honey and Pollination Center here at the university. And I'm now walking, which is much better for me. I like to walk. So this is our very first peace symposium. Um, the Honey and Pollination Center has been in existence for a whole two and a half years. We've gotten very active in the mead world. Um, we created the Honey Wheel, and a few people who were on the tasting panel for the Honey Wheel are here today. Um, and now we're doing this first bee symposium. The bee symposium was sort of a gift from Doug Vincent, who had been doing a similar program over in the uh, Sonoma area for six or seven years. And uh, Doug sat on our committee, and it became a, a wonderful opportunity to take this on and bring it to UC Davis, enlarge it, and grow it, and make something very, very special. We hope this is the first of very of many of these to come. Um, so one of the things that has made this possible, the Honey and Pollination Center is part of the Robert Mondavi Institute, which is located just, most of you probably passed it, it's in a beautiful orange building, it's just on the other side of the road. And the center, the uh, institute houses the Olive Center, and we do a lot of outreach into the community, and it's a very exciting kind of program to be a part of. I always say that I had to get to retirement age to get the job of my dreams, and working with the staff that we have, Claire, the folks you met out at registration, um, Evan, and other people who will be out in the garden tonight, this afternoon. It's been a really fabulous experience. Um, mostly, I'd like to thank the Kaiser Foundation. The Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation was kind enough to actually underwrite this entire event. It's a very exciting opportunity for all of us to begin working with them. This is a new venture for them, too. We hope to continue. In addition, we have a whole group of sponsors, which you can find on page five, and if any of you care to be a sponsor of the center, that's a good time to do it. Um, so the exciting part for us is that this year, I started work with the Department of Entomology and Nematology uh, to create this particular symposium, and I, it expands what I do. I've been working with viticulture and food science departments, so this is a really whole new place for us to be. Just a few little pointers that will be happening. In the back of the room are our grad graduate student poster contest. You're welcome to read those during lunchtime or any, con any of our breaks, which are all indicated inside the book. Um, and uh, just to make sure I have everything covered. And, <laughs> and I think I do. So in case I forgot something, I'll tell you a little later. <laughs> but I'm going to turn this over to Mike Perella, who is the chair of the Entomology and Nematology Department here. said, my name is Michael Perella. I'm the proud chair of the Department of Entomology and Nematology here at UC Davis. I really want to acknowledge the RMI and the Honey and Pollination Center, in particular Claire Hassler and Amina Harris for, you know, really putting this show together. In other words, getting the organization, the funding to do it, and I think us partnering with them, this is only the beginning. We're looking forward to some really great things in the future. What I thought I would do here would be to to give a little overview of the history of bee biology here at UC Davis, just a few minutes. We have a really rich history here, and I think it's worth just pausing and, and discussing that again, again briefly. So I think while now honeybee research and native bee research is becoming very popular across the United States, and that sounds a little crass, but obviously neonicotinoid insecticides, the health of honeybees and all our pollinators, there's a social awareness of that that is unprecedented, there's money, uh, available for research, and now everyone seems to be focused on that, and that is fantastic. But in fact, I think we have been doing honeybee-related research here way before it became popular. Actually, we started doing honeybee research prior to World War II, and so I don't want to start there, but I do want to start with Harry S. Laidlaw, Jr., who was Associate Dean at the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences back in the 1960s, and he managed to get the college to build a separate standalone bee research facility. And you will see that when you visit the Honey Bee Garden this afternoon. I mean, just remarkable. It is the largest, currently still, the largest standalone bee research facility at a major university in the United States. So that was in 1969. And not only did Harry, was Harry able to build it, 
but he was able to staff it as well. So it was really incredible. So he was an active bee biologist, bee geneticist. Many people consider him to be the father or one of the fathers of honeybee genetics. And he developed uh, many of the techniques for artificial insemination of queens. We also had at one time Norm Gary, who was there, was a honeybee biologist as well. Norm is still active and published a book last year. He retired many years ago. We had Robin Thorpe as part of our group. And Robin at that time worked on almond pollination of honeybees, and now he's an emeritus faculty member here doing some fantastic work with native bees and with bumblebees. And, and Robin is here, and I think Robin has signed a few books that we're going to give away as, as door prizes. We had Christine Payne, who was our honeybee physiologist, and she retired a few years ago. We had Robert Page, who was a honeybee geneticist as well, and Rob uh, left, left the department a few years ago. And then a final piece of that puzzle was Eric Musson, who was the extension specialist extraordinaire. So incredible that we had six people focused on honeybee-related research at one university. At best, universities across the country, land-grant universities, maybe they had one person but we had six. It was really an unprecedented effort. Plus, we have about 30 faculty in entomology, and to have six devoted to one insect, again, was really unprecedented. And then again, well, then we had a sad tale, I guess. As people retired or left, it became difficult to justify replacing them, to the point where really the only one that we had at the Bee Lab was Eric Musson. And on his broad shoulders, our research and extension program moved forward. So in about 2007, 2008, 2009, we entered into a partnership with haagen the, the ice cream maker, and basically they started giving us support to, do, uh, to, to build a garden out there, and we'll see that this afternoon. But we also started to hire new faculty. Neil Williams was the first one, a Polynesian ecologist that you will hear from in this, uh, in this symposium. Brian Johnson as well, uh, apiculturalist, and Brian now teaches apiculture at UC Davis. And our most recent hire, Alina Nino, who is our extension specialist, and she has the yeoman's job of actually re trying to replace, which is impossible, Eric Musk, but I think she's doing a fantastic job. So basically, we have gone, you know, almost full circle. And then I'll, I'll end by saying that we are now in negotiations with a partnership with ARS to actually bring two uh, new ARS scientists that would also work at the B Lab. So in that context, looking at where we have been, what we've gone through and what the future looks like, I think it looks brighter than ever. So I expect us to be able to deliver some phenomenal basic information and then also some fun, some uh, really uh, applied information that you can use in terms of dealing with the crisis that surrounds both honeybees and, and native bees. So just a brief brief overview of something I think that's important. Again, we have a rich history here. We're very proud of that, but I think the future looks even even brighter. Okay. So with that as a brief introduction, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Marla Spivak, and I think most people know Marla, but I'll give a little bit of her background here very, very quickly. Um, so we had dinner with Marla last night, and she mentioned to me that she started school at Prescott College in Arizona. So she was there for about two years, I think, and then the college went bankrupt. So, and not because of Marla, but obviously... <laughs> It went bankrupt, and now I'm thinking about it. She mentioned she chose Prescott College because of a there was a, there was a not a camping major, but there was a real emphasis on the outdoors, and she obviously is passionate about that. So basically, when the college went bankrupt, she needed to find a place that would actually take her credits. Right? They they, they would be, she could transfer her credits to another university. She looked everywhere, and I guess one of the few that would actually take her credits was Humboldt State. So she ended up getting a BA degree in Humboldt State. And then from there to uh, Kansas State, where she did her PhD, uh, some tremendous work in Costa Rica, working on Africanized honeybees. And then uh, she did a postdoc at the Center for Insect Science at the University of Arizona. And ever since then, probably in 1993, she started at the University of, of Minnesota, where she has a spectacular program. She is the, um, um, the, the McKenzie Endowed Chair there that, that she holds. Uh, she is also honored, so in 2010 she received the MacArthur Fellowship, which is one of the highest honors that we can give scientists in the United States. And for those that don't know, it does come with a $500,000 uh, payout, basically, that goes to Marla over a five-year period. So I guess she's in the last year of that, uh, uh, that in, in, in incredible honor, I guess is the best way to say it. 
Her work is uh, phenomenal. She does great fundamental work. She publishes in neurobiology and animal behavior and evolution. But I think one of her real strengths is to take that information and translate that into presentations and into programs and into workshops so she can relate to, to an audience uh, such as this. I'll say one more thing. Uh, there is a new bee and pollination center that is being built at the University of Minnesota. And I think without question, I am sure she is the driving force behind that. So with that brief introduction, let's please uh, welcome Marla.